Hello everyone and welcome back. We hope that you already had a good morning session and we are now continuing with our lecture. The topic of the next lecture is dyspnea. Our next speaker is going to talk to us via Zoom. He's from Ireland and he's currently working as an emergency physician at the Mater Misericordia University Hospital in Dublin. He's also the director of emergency ultrasound education there and he's also a specialist in point of care ultrasound. Please welcome Dr. Kean McDermott. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you to the Sono for You Grats group and Anita and Esther for making contact. Um, I'm Kean McDermott, and as an um, Esther said, I'm an emergency physician from Dublin in Ireland, and I'm the director of emergency ultrasound education at our hospital. Now, I know when people start to talk about lung ultrasound and cardiac ultrasound, it's like an alphabet soup of letters that describe different signs. So there's A lines and there's B lines and there's E waves and there's L waves. And I'm going to try and make things very simple for you guys today. I'm trying to, going to try and make a complex topic um, explain the basics in, conce in the concepts of A, B, and C of lung ultrasound. We use lung ultrasound all the time, and it makes a huge difference in our emergency department. So let's start off with a clinical case. So this gentleman has presented to your hospital. He was brought in by ambulance, and he has marked shortness of breath. So this chap is wheezy, but he has no restrictive airway disease, no problem with the airways in the background. Now, we know that from his history, he has a mild CCF and he had a previous uh, acute coronary syndrome a number of years ago, and he's a current smoker. And when you examine him, these are the findings that you see. So his oxygen saturations are a little bit low and he's tachypneic. His heart rate is 110 and his blood pressure is slightly higher than it usually measures. So on the right hand side, you see a list of options, treatment options that you could use. You need to think about isolating this guy. Has he got an infectious disease like COVID? You can choose from any one of these uh, treatment options on the right-hand side. And the problem up until now, or in the last couple of years, has been that we just don't know what's the best option to go for without using lung ultrasound. You're just not sure where, you're, where you need to go with your treatment. This is his chest x-ray. And I really don't like chest x-ray anymore because it's not all that diagnostic. It really doesn't guide me as to what I should do with my patient. So do I need to give him antibiotics? Do I need to diurese him? It's not helpful. Chest x-ray is just not helpful. However, when we start to use lung ultrasound, we find out that lung ultrasound, it's your friend. There's lots of good quality, high quality research out there to say that lung ultrasound, it's as good as CT imaging for all causes of respiratory failure. We know that it takes less time to perform because it's being done at the bedside. In the time that I'm waiting for the, ultras for the chest x-ray to be done, I'm able to do the lung ultrasound and get most of the answers. It's just as accurate and mo certainly more accurate than a chest x-ray and in some cases, um, almost as, as accurate as a CT scan. And the big advantage is that if I need to do some real-time procedures, I can be guided in real time by um, using lung ultrasound. So if I need to drain a pleural effusion, I can use lung ultrasound to tell me exactly where I'm going. So there really is no reason not to like lung ultrasound. Lung ultrasound is your friend. Now, the good news is that you're already doing a version of lung ultrasound. It's easy to start out with. When you perform a, an EFAST exam and you look for fluid or you look for a, a tension pneumothorax, you're already doing a version of lung ultrasound. Now, you're starting out with this baseline and this, this is the easy bit, but it does, the learning curve does become more steep and it does become more complex as you delve further into the more complex um, presentations of, of lung pathology, but you're already doing it. So you've started out on your journey with lung ultrasound. So let's dive in and see how we actually do lung ultrasound. I use a curved linear probe, and that's the one you see on the top of the screen, the larger picture. 
And sometimes when I want to get better um, image resolution, I may use a, a linear probe with a higher frequency. Now I tend to choose a long preset. And if you don't have a long preset on your machine, you could choose an abdominal preset because you want to turn off all um, image optimizers because you want to get a, right, a nice grainy image because long ultrasound depends on artifacts. Always remember to set the, uh, the field depth at the appropriate depth so that you're seeing the structures that you want in the middle of your screen and you're not wasting any of the pixelation power. And um, put the focus point at the plural line, and that'll give you much better image resolution if you use that. So there are the tweaks that you can apply to your current settings. Great if you have a long preset. If not, you can tweak your current machine. Okay, so this is how you're going to do it. I start off initially with my curved linear or linear probe in the on the anterior chest so you're hunting around on the anterior chest in as many spaces as possible and you're looking on both sides and that's the image that you're going to see um, you'll see a bright white plural line at the top of the screen and two ribs on the other side and hunt around in as many different places as you need to get more information so that's the anterior chest next you're going to hunt around the lateral chest and again, you place your probe on the patient's chest and look at where you expect the diaphragm to be. And the diaphragm is that big, white, bright line on the screen. And you see a beautiful lung curtain coming across the field as well. So that lung curtain means that you have air in the lungs. And that's what you want to see. And again, hunt in a couple of different locations um, for, for, that, for that view. Now, don't forget the posterior chest. And especially in, in coronavirus, we found that the, the posterior chest is where the, the virus um, locates uh, predominantly. So you want to have a look in that posterior chest. So again, put your ultrasound probe, your linear probe, or your curved linear probe with the probe marker pointing towards the patient's head for your orientation and search around in as many different places as you can on that posterior chest wall. Using the ultrasound, it really is like um, where do you put your stethoscope? So as you put your stethoscope on the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior chest, it's exactly the same with your ultrasound probe. So hunt around, find as many different views of the chest pathology as you can, and repeat on both sides. So the image that you see, this is how it's generated. You start out with your probe on the skin surface, and underneath the skin surface, you have your ribs, and your pleural line is in blue. The machine is very intelligent and converts your picture and flips it upside down like this or over to one side. And what you're seeing is um, the skin and soft tissues in yellow, two ribs, and the blue line is the plural line. And that's how it overlays the picture, the original picture that you started off, the graphic from the patient's chest. And this is what your actual image turns out to be. So you have your skin and soft tissues, the gray buttons or the gray um, areas are your ribs and the blue line is the plural line. And that's your graphic representation of what you see on the screen. So it turns it from um, the patient's chest into the sonographic image you see on the screen. Now, the images that you see on the screen are, they're all artifactual. Well, the top layer is actual images and the from the plural line onwards is artifactual. And these images are generated because of acoustic impedance of fluid and soft tissue and the relative differences between the acoustic impedance of soft tissue and fluid that exists in the lung. So in the thorax, you have gas and fluid and they have opposite locations and they are mixed in by different pathological processes. And these differences in acoustic impedances and their relative uh, amounts and densities of air and fluid. That's what generates your artifacts. So all the actual signs arise from the plural line. But in between all that, you may have lung sliding, no lung sliding. You may have A lines or B lines, consolidation and effusions. So you're looking for the patterns of artifacts that are generated by all these different pathological processes. And it's up to you and me to interpret all these patterns and match them back to the patient's, uh, patient's presentation. So that's how ultrasound will help you. 
So let's start out on a journey. Um, a is for A lines. Now, A lines and lung sliding. A lines are what is called, the technical term for them is a horizontal reverberation artifact. So what you have is the ultrasound beam bouncing up and down between the surface of the transducer and the bright white reflector that is the pleural line. And it causes, you see the actual pleural line, but then you see a weaker reflection of the pleural line at evenly spaced depths beyond the pleural line, deeper into the tissue. And that's because your sound waves are reflected up and down between the transducer head and it acts as a mirror and it causes these uh, weaker structures to be reflected at a deeper distance. So that's a normal finding. A lines is what you expect in a normally aerated lung. So watch out for that. And this is the image that you will see. So you see a bright white reflector on the top of the screen and there's an A line here and it's bordered on both sides by, um, by rib shadows. So that's an A line, that's what you want to see. An A line means that there's air in the lungs and there's very little fluid. And that's, that's an easy place to start. So have a look at this picture. And that's an A line. Well, it's the lung, it's the pleural surface, but watch what's happening at the pleural surface here. The pleural line is shimmering. It's moving, it's moving left and right. And that's called lung sliding. And this lung sliding is independent of the muscular movement up and down of the patient's breathing. So the patient may be able to control the movement of this tissue here by breathing deeper, but the patient is unable to control this movement here. So that's a lung sliding pattern. And the combination of A lines and lung sliding, that's what you want to see. That's normally aerated lung, and that's a normal finding. So bear that first A pattern in mind when you're looking at a lung ultrasound. Now, the next thing, is the absence of lung sliding. So it's great when you see lung sliding, but if you don't see lung sliding, it's a little bit more complicated. It may be caused by several things, and these are some of the things that may cause absence of lung sliding. So it may be caused by a pneumothorax. It may be caused by reduced or no lung ventilation. It may be caused by severe bolus COPD or emphysematous disease or adhesions at the lung, or it may be caused by pain and splinting, which means the patient isn't breathing as much. So don't be caught out by false positives that might happen. If you see lung sliding, that's great. But if you don't see lung sliding, bear in mind that there's a number of different things that may cause it. And you need to go back to the patient and match the clinical presentation with the actual ultrasound finding. All that said, Ultrasound is fantastic at picking up a pneumothorax. So its sensitivity is quite high and its specificity is very high. So what that means is if lung sliding is absent, you may have a pneumothorax, but you may also have false positives. But with a specificity in the 90% range, if lung ultrasound, if lung sliding is present, you can rule out a pneumothorax. So that's how the properties of that test for pneumothorax that's how it helps you. So it's quite a good test, and it's definitely better than a chest X-ray for picking up a pneumothorax, but it's not quite as good as CT, but it has been validated in lots of international studies. So we've talked about lung sliding and A-lines and how that might help you for a pneumothorax. You can also turn on M-mode, and I'm sure you've been shown M-mode function on the ultrasound machines over the last couple of days. And basically, M-mode picks a single point along the grayscale image, the B-mode image, and charts the, process, the progress of that ultrasound beam over time. And the yellow line on the screen is the M-mode M -mode cursor. It corresponds to this image in the center. And people say that it's, it looks like a seashore sign. So you see in the far field or closer to the bottom of the screen is the sand and then the sea is closer to the top of the screen. So that's with, that's the normal pattern. So that's when you have lung sliding. So again, that would be very much, you think that there's no pneumothorax there. So that's the seashore sign. Then if you have an absence of lung sliding and you can put on your M mode function again, 
Um, the picture isn't there, but it's thought to look like a barcode. So there's very little difference. There's no sea and no sand. There's no differentiation between that. So that's the barcode sign on M mode for a pneumothorax. Now, to be honest, I don't use M mode all that much in my practice. I think it's useful, but I prefer to have a high quality, a high quality B mode image and try to focus my energies on finding a high quality B mode image. But if there are circumstances where M mode can be useful. And a lot of it is re related to the high temporal resolution of M mode imaging. So bear that in mind, you could use M mode. So if you're looking for a pneumothorax and you see this sign, that's really helpful because the sign that you're seeing is a lung point and that corresponds to the interface, the junction of collapsed lung and lung that's tethered normally to the inside of the thoracic cavity. And you've just picked the point, you've imaged that point right at the junction of the two, of the two areas. So it's, um, when you see that, you can be quite sure that you've seen the pneumothorax. So it's quite, it's quite specific for a pneumothorax, a lung point. So watch out for that. But it does take a little bit of hunting around to find that point. And you can track it up and down and left and right, especially after a procedure, it might increase, it might move that lung point. But that's what its equivalent looks like on a CT. Okay, so we've looked at A lines and lung sliding. Let's move on to B. B is for B lines. This is another type of reverberation artifact. And it arises again from the pleural line. And if you look at an A line and this schematic di diagram here, you see there's a little bit more fluid rather than air at the, underneath the pleural line, and that's how B lines are generated. So a regular B line will start at the pleural line. It will extend all the way down to the far field, which is often 12, 15, 18 centimeters, and it crosses and obliterates an A line. So it dominates an A line and it moves with lung sliding. So as you breathe in, you should see a B line move. Now, a beeline is formed. We're not entirely sure how a beeline is formed, but one theory tells us that the interlobular septae that are normally thin at a microvascular level in the lung tissues, they're normally thin when they're not filled with fluid, but when they become fluid filled, you get thickening of the interlobular septae. And that thickening happens as a result of fluid, fibrosis or pus, and it creates another interface between the air and the fluid. And we know when we have another interface, we're going to get an artifact generated. And that artifact, artifact appears as a beeline. So this is what a beeline looks like. So notice the thin pleural line up at the top of the picture and the beelines, they're going to reverberate down to the bottom of the screen. And uh, that's what they appear like. So long rays arising from the thin pleural line and going from top to bottom. One mistake that people make is thinking that beelines reflect fluid. While they may reflect fluid, they don't actually reflect fluid, but they re reflect an increased amount of fluid density in the tissues. And if you think of it like that, it will allow you to realize why um, all these different conditions may cause uh, beelines to be generated. So all of these conditions may cause increased fluid density at the lung tissue, and they may give rise to beelines. If you see beelines in one area of the lung, so focal beelines, it may be as a result of pneumonia, it may be atelectasis, it may be a traumatic lung contusion, or it may be an area of scarring or adhesions or even a pulmonary infarct. So bear that in mind if you see one small area of the lung or a larger area of the lung that has focal B lines. So this may be the cause. Now, as the B line pattern becomes more extensive and you see diffuse B lines, you'll see them in a lot more areas of the lung. So that may be caused by pulmonary edema. It may be, may be caused by multilobular, translobular pneumonia, whereas before it might be caused by a unilobular pneumonia. So the pneumonia might be getting more extensive. It may also be caused by pneumonitis. And I'll explain that to you in a moment, how a, 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 a widespread pattern of inflammation appears on in the lungs. And the trouble is it may also be caused by 
pulmonary fibrosis, which is a chronic lung condition. So it can be on the basis of B lines alone, it may be difficult to, to, uh, to tell a, an acute and a chronic condition apart. But when you see B lines, you know that something is abnormal in that lung tissue. So if you're looking for pulmonary edema, you're looking for three or more B lines in one area and on bilateral lung fields. So that's an important, um, you, you're looking for B lines in, in two or more um, areas in that uh, lung field and it has to be bilaterally. So it's a, it's a widespread condition, not localized. So here's how you might see a, 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 pulmonary, a pulmonary edema appear. So these are confluent B lines. And we see B lines that are widely spaced apart, but in the case of these B lines, they're quite densely packed. And this is important too, because the more densely packed these B lines are, it means that the fluid, that there's increased density of that fluid, or there's more fluid within that lung field. And you can actually track the density of these B lines as you give your patients diuresis. So if you were to give them diuresis, this number of B lines would regress or reduce um, over the number of hours. So you can watch and track your patient's progress. So it's really, really useful to be able to do that. And I think that precedes the findings on chest x-ray. And you can do it yourself at the, at the bedside to watch your patient improve. So B lines are, are, are a pretty useful artifact. Okay, we're going to move on to C. And C is for consolidation. So a lung consolidation, it's an area of lung. It has two things going on. It's partially aerated, so some air, so you would expect to see some A-lines. And as well, it also has some fluid within that lung tissue. So that fluid is high density infective material. And what you'll see is this zone here in the blue. So it's partially aerated and it has partially, um, uh, partially aerated and part of it also contains um, infective material. So what you'll see is an echo poor region or an echo free region, which is the black area on the screen. And the, it may also appear like tissue where it's mixed. So it might seem like it looks like the spleen or the liver underneath. If you have a, a lung consolidation, have a look out for a paranemonic effusion, which is an area of effusion close to an, inf an infection. That often happens. And you may have a shred sign, which is the kind of, it's like um, you've ripped up a piece of paper and it's the interface between the aerated and the non-aerated lung. So that's important to look out for. So there's a spectrum of findings. So you may have hepatization, which is the tissue-like appearance of the lung. It may have bronchograms within it, and these can be static or dynamic. You can have large or small uh, pleural consolidations. And Watch out for those signs, and they'll appear in a variety of different um, patients. You may have B lines that are focal, or you may have more widespread B lines, and watch out for that paranemonic effusion as well. So this is how it appears. Um, what I see here on the left-hand side is uh, my lung tissue is all stippled with bronchograms. The tissue on this side of the diaphragm looks like it's the uh, same as the tissue here, and the big white line that divides in the center is the diaphragm. So that's hepatization with an air bronchogram. So that lobe is heavily consolidated with some air or fluid trapped, which is represented by those white areas. So that's really suggestive of a, a pneumonia. Um, this next patient is a patient I imaged uh, a couple of months ago. He has a couple of different signs going on. So it's a small pleural effusion up at the top of the screen. That's the echo-free space. Um, this is a piece of lung tissue here that's floating around in the pleural effusion. And right here um, is the shred sign. So an area of um, where, the, uh, where the fluid filled and the aerated tissue mix. And that's why it gives that dirty shadow, bright white shadow. And that's significant for the, the infection, where the infection meets aerated lung. And if you watch really carefully, um, right here, you will see some focal B lines appear, which, increase, which suggests that there's increased fluid density in that tissue. So lots of hard and soft signs for a pneumonia in this patient. And you see, I have to image all the way deep down in the lateral portion of the lung, down to 15 centimeters. So... That's a very suggestive cause. And sometimes the chest x-ray does, does not show 
Uh, it's a static picture, so it doesn't show it in real time, and it just doesn't show the extent of the changes that are involved. Here's another picture. Again, we have either spleen or liver on the right-hand side. I'm not sure which, and it's a little bit difficult to tell because we're zoomed in. But this is dia diaphragm here, and this, again, is densely consolidated material. And if you watch, you'll see little tubes and little bits of air running in that densely consolidated lung tissue. So this is a, a basal consolidation with um, fluid and air bronchograms. So we're almost certain that this is an infective process going on. So really useful to put the ultrasound probe on at an early stage when you're examining your patient, you listen, then put the probe on. And if you see this, you know your patient has a pneumonia. Okay, so yes, we should be moving on to D, but I'm, I'm going to replace D with um, uh, this guy. So my other C is for COVID-19. And I want to talk to you about this because lung ultrasound, it's kind of changed the way I've approached COVID-19 over the last couple of months. It has very characteristic changes for COVID-19. So when you put on an ultrasound probe, if you see these following changes, you can be quite sure you're dealing with a viral pneumonitis. So different from a pneumonia, but a, a viral pneumonitis that affects the lung surface. And in our hospital, um, I put a lung ultrasound on the chest wall and I, I do this at the same time as we're taking a PCR test, we know a molecular PCR test will take several hours to come back. Even the fastest ones take up to two hours. But I can risk stratify my patients and say with quite a degree of certainty, yes, this patient has uh, COVID-19 or not based on the lung ultrasound findings. And I'm, I'm able to isolate them at an early stage and I can even predict the severity of their infection. So we know when we're using um, lung ultrasound for COVID, that the findings are almost as good as, um, as CT. And we just can't CT everybody. And we know that chest X-ray is not good enough. So that's why lung ultrasound is the perfect tool for COVID-19. So these are images from some of the first patients in our hospital um, in March and April that I, that I imaged. And um, they all turned out to have COVID-19, which is why I'm showing you them. So these images here, this is the plural line. Again, we're zoomed in. And um, if you look here, there's small pockets of B lines. And there are areas that are skipped. So not er every area has homogenous B lines. There's small skip lesions. But I think the appearance of that plural line, it just looks angry and inflamed if you look at it. It just it does not look like a happy, happy lung surface, a nice thin plural line. And this other image on the right-hand side, if you look carefully here, right beside the rib, there's a small subplural, a small plural effusion at that side, or a, a small consolidation, sorry, and a small sub, uh, plural effusion just above it. So that lung is getting progressively inflamed and angry, and it's a pneumonitis that's causing it. Let's have a look at some more pictures. Um, again, watch that beeline pattern. And here's the plural line again. And look how it's coarse and thickened. It's just angry and it's inflamed and it's it's has lots more fluid and inflammation at that B line and watch the B line pattern at that sorry at the plural line it, again uh, the B line pattern is not consistent it doesn't come from everywhere there are areas that are skipped so that's what we tend to see in 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 COVID nineteen now this is a picture that's caused by a viral pneumonitis. So it's also the picture you might see if you put the ultrasound probe on a child's back that has bronchiolitis, so RSV bronchiolitis, or as we move into the flu season, we might see it influenza A or influenza B. And that's what makes the whole process so difficult to tease it apart. And you have to go back to your patients and say, are they likely to have COVID or are they likely to have influenza? Um, and this is our final image of, of, of COVID. Uh, again, watch this beeline pattern. It's inconsistent there are areas that are skipped and you get these small plural effusions um superior or superficial to the b line to the plural line so that's how it looks like in practice now when i was going into all these patients we had to be super careful with ourselves with ppe but we also had to be careful that we didn't contaminate our ultrasound systems and we ended up wrapping up our ultrasound machines in plastic coverings and we found that it just began, became too difficult so we started to transition over to handheld devices and you will recognize this butterfly iq and we've managed to wrap it entirely in a 
a sheath for a plastic sheath for a central line. So the cabling, the iPhone and the butterfly itself is wrapped with sterile gel underneath it. And we're able to image through that, save the pictures onto the screen and they were uploaded onto the server and you can analyze them afterwards. So infection control became a big, big thing for us. And that's how handheld devices became important with COVID-19. So that's um, something that's become important in recent months. And I think you'll see lots of it moving forward as we're all in our second uh, wave in Europe. So we've skipped D and we're going to move on to E for effusions. So you're used to seeing this diagram at this stage. And this is what you see with the pleural effusion. So you see an echo-free space or an anechoic space, and that appears between the parietal and the visceral pleura. And here you see it right here, an echo-free space. Now you should see respiratory movement of the lung within that space. So you should see the lung moving within that space. And we know there's lots of different bits of material that can sit in that. So there's a transudate versus an exudate. And sometimes we're going to be able to decide what it is based on the appearance of the pleural effusion. Let's have a look at some pleural effusions. This is a simple enough small pleural effusion and you see the lung tissue popping into view when the patient breathes in and breathes out. And there's the echo free space above the diaphragm. Now this is a larger pleural effusion and I know you can see the diaphragm is the brightest white line and you can see a large, large area of echo-free space, anechoic space, which represents the, a large pleural effusion. And in the middle of it, bobbing in and out, you see, a, you see the lung appearing. So the lung is collapsed and compressed within that pleural effusion, and you can see it moving into the picture. So that's typical of a, of a simple pleural effusion. So this pleural effusion is a little bit more complex. If you look carefully, you can see little dots of debris um, on either side, that lung tissue is bobbing around. Again, you can see the lung tissue, but you can see the echogenic material within that. And that may give you the, a hint to the cause of the pleural effusion. So there's a transudate or there's an exudate, and you can decide whether you should drain or take a sample of that pleural effusion. And this is our Halloween pleural, pleural effusion. So this is a septated pleural effusion. And all these strands are fibrin deposits that you see within the normal pleural effusion. So imagine they're all gone and you know you will recognize that as a pleural effusion, but um, that's a septated pleural effusion. And you may get this in a very severe pneumonia or an atypical organism that causes a pneumonia, maybe like a TB. Um, and this patient will not respond to regular antibiotics. They may need a large bore chest drain put in to clear out all those strands because you get loculated pleural effusions areas that have um, infected material in between those strands. Um, so the sensitivity of ultrasound for picking up a pleural effusion is quite high. If you see it, it's there. If you don't see it, it's not there. So it's a straightforward test for you to do when you have a, short, a patient that's short of breath in front of you. And a website that I like going to is, it's called the Pocus Atlas. And um, you'll see its sister website, it's called the Evidence Atlas, and it'll show you lots of high quality images. And it'll talk to you about the evidence um, that supports the use of all the different ultrasound modalities for different conditions. And there's a fantastic section on lung ultrasound and its sensitivity and specificity for all these conditions that I'm discussing today. And I often go back to this website when I need a refresher for conditions. Okay, we've run through A, B, C, D, and E, and we've even looked at a bit of coronavirus. So let's go back to our patient from the, from the start. Now we've started some treatment. We've given him some oxygen. So his oxygen saturations have come up from 89% to 92%. His heart rate has come down a little bit and his blood pressure is still high. While we were ordering that chest X-ray, and we need to do that because our in-house physicians, that's what they understand, we rolled in our ultrasound machine. And while we were waiting for the chest X-ray in our hospital, it takes 10 to 15 minutes for a chest X-ray, a portable chest X-ray to happen in the resource room. We were able to bring in our lung ultrasound. And we, in most cases, we are pretty confident of the diagnosis at the bedside before the X-ray ever arrives. So for this gentleman, here's the pattern we saw. And I'm putting the case together 
when I use these multiple um, images from his chest. So the numbers up the top are R2, L2. That just uh, identifies his anterior lung space. And R4 is his lateral lung space. So R is right and L is left. So let's see what we see. In his anterior lung fields, uh, we see lots and lots of B lines. So a thin pleural line, lots of B lines. And I can count more than three in that lung space. And I'd certainly go hunting in more than one lung field to find more B lines. And when I look on his left hand side, again, I see more than three B lines in each plural space. And again, go hunting to make sure that it's just B lines that you're dealing with. And when I look on his right lateral lung field, I see a pleural effusion and I see some focal B lines and some lung tissue. So when I put all of this information together, this gentleman's, his background uh, CCF or heart failure probably has been tripped off by a lung infection and he gets worsening pulmonary edema and he has a small pleural effusion which goes with his uh, heart failure and you can see a pocket of uh, infected lung in his right lung base which caused the whole condition to spiral out of control and I've figured out all of that within the time it takes for my ultrasound for my chest x-ray to arrive so we need to make sure to correlate all the findings from our lung ultrasound with our echo you can look at its heart as well and see what its systolic and diastolic function is like and make sure everything fits so that's how lung ultrasound helps me with my sickest patients before i wrap up i want you to remember that while your ultrasound machine it's a fantastic piece of technology it still is operator dependent. So it still depends on you to get high quality images. It still depends on you to interpret these images. And you have to match the images that you see on the screen with the presentation from the patient. So you have to integrate all these images and make sure they match with the clinical presentation of the patient. The ultrasound will not diagnose your patient. We're not at that stage yet. You will diagnose your patient. So it's up to us to scan lots, scan carefully, get high quality information or education, and then interpret all our images correctly. And if you're looking for more information on how to do a lung ultrasound, this is a fantastic site by one of my friends and colleagues, Jacob Avila, based in Lexington in Kentucky. And this QR code, if you take a picture of this now, it will take you directly to a suite of videos that are produced and will show you how to do a lung ultrasound. So I've done, I've done a quick whistle stop tour. You can watch these videos over and over again to perfect your technique when you're considering a lung ultrasound for a dyspneic patient. Guys, thank you for having me. Um, please let me know if there are any questions on what I've talked to you about today. And um, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, that's the end of my presentation, um, Esther and Anita. Fantastic. Um, I didn't quite get what the lung point is. Could you explain that again? You will in a second. Thank you. Okay, let's do that. I'll just jump back. Yeah, really good question. If you see a lung point, you know um, pretty much that you're dealing with a, a pneumothorax. So that's what it means clinically. And uh, let's play. OK, can you see that image on the screen? So if you think of, um, if you try and imagine what you're seeing on a CT, a CT is pretty useful to compare it with. So the point where my cursor is now is the point where the normal lung is tethered to the inside of the lung wall. And this above it here is where the um, 
is where it's been pulled away from the from the lung wall, like in a pneumothorax, if you had a traumatic um, accident or something like that to cause a pneumothorax or a spontaneous pneumothorax, we'll show this picture as well. So the junction between normal lung and abnormal lung is here on a CT scan. And that corresponds to the junction between normal lung sliding here and then absent lung sliding here. So absent lung sliding and normal lung sliding. And that lung point is where the two pieces meet, the transition point between normal lung and abnormal lung. And that's the exact same spot right here. And if you see that finding on a lung ultrasound, you know that you've hit gold because you can say with lots of certainty that it's a pneumothorax. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You know what? Um, people don't really understand how beelines are created. Um, I think it's most useful to, I need to go forward. I, it's most useful to know what they look like and know what they represent and have an idea of how they're created. So I'll go over it and try and explain a little bit differently. The the theory is that you get increased fluid at the arteriolar levels or at the distal lung alveoli level. And that blue line shows where there's increased fluid density within the lungs. And the ultrasound beam gets trapped at this point here and starts to bounce around. It starts to reverberate up and down between these bubbles of fluid, okay? And when it does, it produces this pattern. It produces this short path of reverberation. And what you see on the ultrasound screen is this. You see this reverberation pattern and it's all caused by the ultrasound beam being trapped up at this level and bouncing around between the small bubbles of fluid and producing um, a ray of beelines a beeline artifact distally beyond where the uh, where the fluid is trapped. So it's it's a difficult concept without going quite deep into lung ultrasound physics, but that's what people think causes it. So I think it's important if you can recognize it, have an idea of what causes it, and then understand what the pattern represents clinically. Does that make sense? Are there any other questions? Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your talk then. And we were very happy that it worked out so well and that we were able to listen to you today. <laughs> uh, we will now have a lunch break until 1 p.m. And we ask you to stay seated until we give you the uh, lunch packages and we're gonna take a picture of you. <laughs>